Good evening, I'm James Goodale for the Digital Age. Got a great show for you tonight with Max Boot, who's an historian, also a political commentator. He's written a book about the history of war, and we want to ask him, does history tell us we will win the war in Iraq and against terrorism? That's the issue tonight. And Max, I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having I'm, me on. I'm looking forward to the answer now. We want to... I wish I knew the answer. Yeah, no, you better know the <laughs> answer. Okay, well, here's the book. And it's called War Made New, Technology Warfare and the Course of History, 1500 to Today. Now, that's uh, an imposing title, but I want to tell you and I want to tell the audience, I read every page and loved every page. Oh, bless you. Thank you very much. I mean, this is the uh, program about the information and digital age, and what you had to say confirmed my view that the information age is a great thing. Well, let me, let me just ask, I'm going to tell you what I got out of this as okay. sort of a non-expert um, uh, reader. Uh, here are a couple of themes uh, and get your comment. Uh, one, uh, technology doesn't necessarily give uh, someone an exclusive advantage when uh, gunpowder is invented, uh, when the computer is invented, when the automobile is invented, um, nor uh, does it give the wealthy uh, nation necessarily an advantage. What really counts, as I read, you, read your book, is that you've got to apply the technology because everyone will have access to the technology and everyone will know how to make a automobile. It's how you apply it and it's how you organize it. Right. And if you apply it and organize it well, you're going to have an advantage uh, in warfare. Now, is, is this, uh, this is sort of a layman's view of your book, and I summed it up in a sentence or two, and you got a lot of pages there. Did I do it wrong? No, you summed it up very well. That is, that is, in fact, one of the main themes of my book, and it's illustrated over and over again through the course of history, including one of the most famous episodes that I write about, which is the Blitzkrieg in 1940. And how was it that the Germans were so successful and overrunning France and the Low Countries. It wasn't because they invented the tank and the airplane. It wasn't because they had more tanks or airplanes or better tanks and airplanes than the Allies. It was because they figured out what to do with tanks and airplanes much better than the Allies, and they figured out how you could utilize tanks and airplanes coordinated by two-way radios to fight this fast-moving war of maneuver, whereas the Allies were still stuck in a static trench warfare mindset of World War I. And the Germans had a much more efficient bureaucracy and organization, the German general staff, for taking advantage of new technologies much better than their adversaries did. And that's one illustration of many of the trend that you're talking about, which is that it's not technology per se, it's really what you do with it. And who's got a more effective government for harnessing weapon systems that may be available to everybody? Yeah, I was surprised that uh, uh, the Swedes even were a world power at one time uh, during the gunpowder age, uh, but yet they were uh, because they're able to do apparently what you said. What makes for the kind of government that creates the ability to have an effective use of whatever the newest dimension is? Well, it's very hard to generalize because governments that have been effective in innovating militarily and technologically are not necessarily liberal democratic governments. In fact, when you talk about Sweden in the 17th century, they were a very effective innovator under King Gustavus Adolphus, really mm. an absolute monarch, just as the Germans were very effective innovators in the 19th and 20th centuries when they weren't terribly democratic. What you do have to have is some degree of accountability within the bureaucracy. You have to have some openness and to new ideas, to new ways of doing things, some cultural dynamism, some ability to exploit new inventions. Because one of the interesting things about new inventions, of course, is that if they're big enough, they can shake the entire social structure. Because often, the way societies have been structured has been based on the way military power is deployed. And so, for example, gunpowder was tremendously subversive to the feudal lords who'd relied upon uh, deploying military power on horseback. That was the source of their authority. And then all of a sudden you have these new gunpowder armies come along when a peasant armed with a musket can kill a nobleman on a horse. That turns the entire world upside down. And you have to have a society and a government that's able to make those kinds of changes and to shift power and to find new ways of doing things. And all sorts of governments over the years have been successful in doing that, whether it's the Swedish government and the 
17th century or the Japanese government in the late 19th century or the American government more recently. So it's very hard to generalize, but whether liberal, democratic, or, or more despotic, governments have to have an ability to change and to be efficient and to be relatively honest and uncorrupt in harnessing new inventions. That's been uh, one common thread throughout history. Do you need a Billy Mitchell? Everyone knows Billy Mitchell. Uh, at least I know Billy, Billy yeah. Mitchell. Billy Mitchell, uh, sort of in my view of popular history, was the renegade uh, Air Force, would he be at that time? Or Army Air Force, I guess. Army Air uh, Corps, right. Army, Army Air Corps officer who thought that uh, air power was the power of the future, and he couldn't get anybody to agree with him. He had a lot of money. He was a show person. Um, do you need someone who is uh, who may not always be right? I don't think Mitchell was always right, but he certainly was on the right path. It looks like. Do you need someone who is going to dramatize and fight the bureaucracy? Is is that a theme, or is Billy Mitchell stand by himself? No, there have been a number of uh, self-proclaimed uh, rebels like Billy Mitchell, who was fighting the military establishment in the 1920s on behalf of air power. Or at the same time in the UK, you had J.F.C. Fuller and Basil Liddell Hart, who were fighting the British military establishment on behalf of armor. And those uh, rebels get a lot of publicity, and they may ultimately do some good, but ultimately what I, what I found in the course of my research is they were really not the most effective innovators because they alienate so many people. I mean, Billy Mitchell was running around accusing uh, generals and admirals of treason, of betraying the country by betraying the Air Corps. And, you know, calling somebody a traitor is not usually the way to win them over. Uh, whereas there were other innovators who worked more quietly behind the scenes who are not well known now. For example, everybody's heard of Billy Mitchell, but who's heard of Admiral Bill Moffat, who was his counterpart in the Navy at the time, the first head of the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics. He was the father of aircraft carriers in the Navy, and he was not one of these showmen. He was not somebody who paraded around the country and got big headlines, but he was a very courtly Southern gentleman who worked very effectively behind the scenes on Capitol Hill and in the Navy Department and in the administration, gaining the support that he needed in order to build up aircraft so carriers. You, so you do, need, you, you do need leaders who see it and can persuade people, right. and, but you've got to see it. Uh, right. Well, let's, let's go to the present because this is the digital age. I was pleased to see that you had a big section on the digital age. Mm -hmm. And here's a set of questions. Is the digital age one of the great revolutions about which you've written in this book? Well, I certainly think so because <laughs> I divide the last 500 years into four great revolutions, beginning with the gunpowder revolution, right. the first and second industrial revolutions, and now the information age driven by advances in microchip technology since the 1960s. And I think the, uh, the, the upheaval has been vast and monumental and has worked out uh, in ways that people would not necessarily have predicted. Because I think if you'd asked anybody in the mid-1990s whether there was in fact an information revolution, those who answered yes would kind of assume that means that American power would be dominant henceforward into the future. Because we were the ones with the cruise missiles and the nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and the stealth bombers and the surveillance satellites, all this amazing technology which we showcased in the Gulf War in 1991. And we still have all that amazing weaponry, and nobody else really does. And yet our adversaries are finding ways to attack us using not the most sophisticated technology, but information technology, uh, effectively utilizing uh, satellite television and cell phones and the Internet and DVDs, all these ubiquitous media that we have promulgated around the world and now are being used against us as well. Well, I want to come back to that yeah. because I, th I think that illustrates perhaps your themes, but I want to get your... You're taken and talk about the, the Gulf War. Yeah. Uh, as I read your book, you look at the Gulf War as a, a sort of a transformation, a, a transformative event because the military services were, quotes, transformed. That's a word we've heard a lot from right. Donald Rumsfeld in uh, 1991. Uh, how did that happen? I mean, what is the impact of the information revolution, particularly on the Gulf War? Well, the American victory in the Gulf War was really born out of defeat in Vietnam 15 years before that, and that's often been the case in history, that a country that gets defeated will suddenly undertake major reforms because it realizes it has to change the way it does business. And the armed forces after 1975 did undertake major reforms, ranging from a new personnel system with the all-volunteer force to new doctrine. Uh, to new training centers, but one of the most important things they did was they integrated new technology, new weapon systems, uh, surveillance aircraft like the AWACS and the J-STARS, uh, new technologies like 
the GPS devices, which were created by the military and first used in 19 GPS means just again, global positioning satellites. Yeah, so which you is, go to the satellite and use that for warfare purposes. Right, it, and it allows you to triangulate your position anywhere in the world with an amazing degree of exactitude. And this is what allowed the famous left hook through the sands of Iraq to occur in 1991, because Saddam Hussein didn't think that armored forces could maneuver through the trackless desert. And they couldn't do that very well until GPS came along and all of a sudden allowed them to pinpoint their exact location. So this was one of many technologies, along with some of the ones I mentioned before, and also one of the most important being the uh, precision guided munitions, or smart bombs, you know, which means yeah. that that bombs or, or missiles have this huge degree of accuracy, which wasn't the case before, where in World War II you were lucky if you could get a bomb within half a mile of the target, whereas by 1991, using this information technology, you could put a bomb through the second floor window of an office building. So the, all these amazing advances came together in the 15 years between Vietnam and the Gulf War and really allowed the American military to win a very important victory, which showcased a lot of their combat prowess, showcased a lot of this information technology, and is one of the most lopsided uh, engagements that we know of in military history. Well, wasn't uh, Rumsfeld right, therefore, based on that history and based on the technological changes that took place to say, hey, look, we've got a new deal here. We've got uh, technology uh, that will enable us to win through smart bombs, through this and that, and therefore, when we attack somebody, we need a slim down, we deserve a slim down force because technology takes the place of people, it's called productivity in the industrial center, mm -hmm. uh, who would otherwise be on the battlefield. The people who are on the battlefield now are, as you point out, fewer and fewer, and that's because of technology. So wasn't Rumsfeld right to say we don't need 10 million people, to, or 500,000 to be precise, because that was the number used in the 91 war to attack uh, Iraq. Wasn't he right to say that? Rumsfeld was right and wrong. He was certainly right that you don't need that many troops anymore to win a conventional war. Because if you're facing an enemy that has tanks and airplanes and a fixed capital, we can do tremendous damage with our precision standoff weaponry. So you don't need that many soldiers on the ground driving tanks or carrying M16s. And you can take Baghdad now, as we did in 2003, with a force of about 120,000 troops, much less than what would have been required a decade ago, much less 50 years before. So Rumsfeld was right about what we can do in conventional high-end warfare. The problem is, what comes next? And you can take Baghdad with 120,000 troops, but you can't hold a country of 26 million people with 120,000 troops, especially when you disband their own security services and army. And that's the problem we faced in Iraq and to some extent in Afghanistan in the last few years, that we've created this very high-tech, relatively lean force that's great at uh, these blitzkrieg type offens offensives going from Kuwait to Baghdad and it really can defeat any conventional force very quickly. But when you get into occupation duty and stabilization missions and peacekeeping and nation building and counterinsurgency, these are all incredibly manpower intensive tasks. And unfortunately, the machines have not yet been invented that will do these things as well as a GI on a street corner holding an M16. How did Rumsfeld get that wrong? Because if you read Rumsfeld's stuff, and I used to read it all the time because he kept talking about the digital age, and it's a program about the digital age. Yeah. I mean, no matter what, I don't know if everyone noticed that, but no matter what came up before him, he'd say we're in a different era. I mean, he was almost, he was a Billy Mitchell, a little later date right. Billy Mitchell because it's not 1991, it's right. 2001. He talks about it all the time. Did he get mesmerized, like some people say, I'm mesmerized about the digital age, and it becomes the uh, be-all and end-all of all cause and effect? Is that what happened to him, do you think? Well, I think the Billy Mitchell analogy is apt because uh, both Mitchell and Rumsfeld were operating in areas of great technological change, and I think you're right. They were somewhat mesmerized by the technology, and so Billy Mitchell was mesmerized by the power of long-range bombers. He basically thought that long-range bombers could win the next war by themselves, and you didn't need the Army, you didn't need the Navy, just send the aviators to do it, which we realize in retrospect is a vast exaggeration because bom long-range bombers are tremendously useful, but you still got to have the other elements of national power. And likewise today, digital technology and precision munitions and all the rest of it, tremendously useful, but you got to have the other elements of power. And unfortunately, what we're seeing today 
is what we've seen in many revolutions in military affairs is that one side will jump out to an early advantage as we have in the digital age, but then the adversaries figure out how to blunt think. your early advantage. They figure out how to avoid getting slaughtered every time they fight you. And our enemies now, we're not finding very many enemies as stupid and as obliging as Saddam Hussein who are willing to fight us in exactly the way that we would prefer. But we're facing much wilier enemies in places like Iraq or Afghanistan who are using guerrilla tactics that negate a lot of our conventional combat advantage. And that's the difficulty that we face okay, today. Okay, so, so this is a pattern we see repeated. Forget the U.S. jumps ahead in 1991 and uh, the other side, the terrorists, uh, catch up. I mean, there is an argument that the 9-11 uh, terrorists may have been even more sophisticated than we were with respect to use of our, our own, tech, own tech technology. ATA, uh, in 1998, uh, had high speed brought into his uh, 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 home in, in Berlin, and there are those who are watching this program who still don't have high, high speed. Okay, so they pick up, the other side picks up the technology. Now, there's got to be a response to that. I mean, there's one thing to say you've got to have a lot of people police the country. But uh, from your vantage point, which is the technological vantage point, here we have the terrorists have this technology, and they're using it as well, maybe, if, if not better. Now, don't we have to have a response to that? Isn't that a huge void? Uh, what do you think? Well, we are formulating a response, but one of the difficulties we face is that the entire U.S. government, including the military, was really built up over the course of the last 50 years <coughs> to fight conventional nation-state adversaries. We do that very well, whether it's the Germans or the Russians or anybody else, we can fight a conventional enemy. We're not used to fighting an enemy like al-Qaeda or the kind of terrorists that we face today who don't have a conventional order of battle. And in many ways, we're handicapped by the fact that we have all this bureaucracy, this industrial age bureaucracy which really hinders us and makes it hard to respond as quickly as our enemies do, whereas our enemies don't have any bureaucracy. They're a pure network, and in many ways that's an advantage to them in the kind of environment, information environment we now face, where they can leverage this technology and take advantage of it and move much more quickly than we can. I'll just give you one, one example of many. Uh, in Iraq today, you know, insurgents are staging these uh, bombings of American convoys often simply to generate television footage and they have cameras standing by to film it and within an, an hour that footage is all over cell phones in Iraq whereas in our case we have this very elaborate military public affairs bureaucracy which takes a day to generate a press release so we have this elaborate bureaucracy and it's slowing down our response whereas they don't have that bureaucracy and so they're able to take advantage of what the technology offers and in some ways what you're seeing is a competition like you see in the business world where you've got the old line companies, the Fords and GMs, which are very lumbering and very slow, and all of a sudden you've got all these new upstarts, whether Toyota, or Microsoft, uh, YouTube, uh, eBay, so many others who are less bureaucratized, more nimble, and that's in many ways the situation we face in international security affairs. Uh, a couple of things. Time Magazine recently uh, had an article saying exactly what you're saying, that the uh, information war, in the terms you described, is being won uh, by, the, by, the, by the insurgents. Um, I read recently that the counterinsurgency manual, and we're talking about counterinsurgency now, right. uh, for the Army or for the military, had not been updated for 20 years. That's right. Well, uh, how do you explain the uh, organizational response uh, to this phenomenon? It, really seems strange that we would have such a great organizational ability to conduct Desert Storm and only a decade later when the information age is in everybody's palm pilot so to speak that uh, we're not able to uh, deal with counterinsurgency on uh, its own terms, so to speak. How do, you, how do you explain that? Well, we've never had as much success in dealing with counterinsurgency as we have with conventional enemies. Oh, I understand that. Compare World yeah. War II to Vietnam, for example. The problem we face today is that counterinsurgency is getting more and more important because with the proliferation of information technology and destructive technology, right. fewer and fewer people have ever more power in their hands yeah, I know, to but, hurt us. But it's... Uh, but it's it's obvious. Right. I mean, well, it's, isn't it obvious? Well, it is obvious. Why isn't it obvious to the, uh, to the military? Well, it is obvious to a lot of people in the military now, but 
it was really 9-11 and even more than that, Iraq, which has been a wake-up call because prior to that and really coming out of Vietnam, the whole ethos of the military was, we don't want to do counterinsurgency. This is not the kind of war we want to fight because we know it's dirty and glorious. It lasts forever. There's no quick victory. We want to fight desert storm-like wars. But of course, the problem is the enemy gets a vote. And the more you show that you can fight and win desert storm type wars, the less likely they are to confront you in that way. And our smarter enemies are using what the technology allows them to do to fight this global insurgency against us, which is very unusual and very hard for us to adapt to. Uh, I want to say uh, you are uh, a well-known political commentator. Uh, you write for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, you have proudly defended your neocon uh, credentials. I want to make it absolutely clear, well, one of the most impressive things about this book is that you cannot tell uh, where the, uh, you know, I, we know where the voice comes from, but the voice is absolutely neutral, uh, not to the point of boredom, by the way, but it's what a historian, a historian does. So if I switch the conversation a little bit, it's not because it's in the book, but because uh, I'm curious about uh, what you think uh, the answer to this question is. Why didn't President Bush tell us at some point in time? You may say he, he did uh, very recently, but at the beginning that what we faced was a decentralized enemy and that the way to beat them uh, at some point in time, maybe not going into Afghanistan, maybe not going to Iraq, but the only way you can beat them is with a similarly decentralized network uh, system. Why didn't he tell us that uh, the terrorists put this whole thing together with some, uh, in some respects through the internet, the whole thing, 9-11 in some part, done through the internet, through high speed. If the president had told us that, we would get public opinion to focus on what kind of war we needed rather than putting more troops in. Why didn't President Bush tell us that? Well, I think he has occasionally said that, and certainly Don Rumsfeld said that a lot, but it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to drive through the changes that will enable you to respond to it. And there are huge bureaucratic interests whose desire is essentially inertia. It's very hard to move giant bureaucracies like the State Department or the Department of Defense or so many others and to get them to change from one kind of threat to another because that requires really changing the whole personnel policy, how you recruit, how you train, how you promote, what kind of skill sets that you need. I mean, for example, in the Department of Defense, uh, or in the armed forces, rather, we have so many people who have tremendous conventional combat skills, fighter pilots, yeah. tank drivers, and so forth. Oh. How many people do we have who understand foreign languages yeah. or cultures? Not that many, yeah. and we have to develop them. But this is a very tough, long-term transition to develop the kind of skills that we need to really counter uh, this global insurgency. Well, let's, let's ask the question now. Uh, does history tell us we're going to win, A, in Iraq, and B, uh, the war against terrorism, if there is such a war. Well, I don't think there is such a war, but yeah. I don't like to call it myself the right. war against terrorism. Well, I, I don't think that history has any answer to offer, at least none that I could perceive. I mean, as a historian, I'm much better at telling you what happened before than telling you what's going to happen in the future. I think, I mean, if I had to bet right now, just standing in my role as a military analyst rather than a historian, I would say the odds are we're probably going to lose in Iraq and will probably win in the broader global war on terrorism, but it's going to take many decades, and it's going to be very costly. But it's hard to say. And one thing that I would caution against, and one of the points I make in the book is, we can't be complacent. Because we look around the country, and it's a very powerful country, a huge country with a tremendous economy, the biggest in the world. And there's a tendency to think that we will prevail against everything. And that's not necessarily the case, because when you look at previous great powers, whether the Spanish Empire or Portugal or Britain or France or so many other Ottomans, Chinese, so many other great powers also felt on top of the world and became complacent and didn't respond to changes in technology and especially in military technology and therefore saw smaller, more nimble rivals taking advantage of them and ultimately they led to their decline and fall. And I'm not saying that's going to happen tomorrow, but that's a long-term danger that we have to think about. And we can't assume just because we seem on paper to be much more powerful than our adversaries that we will inevitably prevail. And we're seeing that, of course, in Iraq, where we're much more powerful than the enemies we face, and yet we're slowly being defeated by them. That's a real cautionary tale for us to ponder. Your simple-minded rules here, it's how you apply it and whether you get the bureaucracy. Right. One, are we applying it correctly, it being the technology? Well, I don't. Yes or no? I would say no. Uh, are we organized appropriately? I would say no. Well, then, then you would have to say, 
uh, as a reader of history, the lesson I got out of this book is, unless those two things change, we're not going to win. Well, I think you're right. I mean, the reason why I say ultimately I think we will win is because I think we will change. And I think one of the positive things about this country is we are adaptable. And we've seen transformations occur, for example, after Pearl Harbor or other previous disasters. And I think that ultimately we do have that kind of creativity and that dynamism that will allow us to make the changes necessary. But we're clearly not there yet. And we need to make changes if we're going to be successful against the kind of enemies that we face. Uh, current question. Are you a surgist? In other words, are you in favor of a surge? I am, um, I guess my view is sort of tepid support. I'm willing to give it a shot because I'm not sure that anybody has a much better idea at the moment. And even leading Democrats are not saying we ought to pull out tomorrow. I think that if we do make a bigger commitment, if it's coupled with other changes, uh, such as increasing support to the Iraqi security forces, uh, such as instituting identity cards for Iraqis so we can tell who the bad guys are, such as locking up more bad guys behind bars. If all those changes are coupled with more troops, uh, and those troops are not just deployed to these large bases, but are actually sent out into the field to work with the Iraqi civilian population, I think it is possible to have more success. But we have to admit right now it's a long shot that the odds are against those prevailing in Iraq. But I think the but consequences of failure would be so terrible, and, and the Iraq study group admitted that they would be so terrible, that I think we have to try to salvage something from a very serious and dire situation. And so I'm willing to go along with the surge, but I don't have any great illusions that it's going to be a panacea. Uh, you were uh, much in favor of the war uh, with a neocon point of view that uh, it would be a model of democracy. Uh, looking at it through whatever lens you wish to look at, but you're here as a historian first, and as a political commentator, uh, secondly, uh, would you do it all over again? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. That's all I ask. All I ask is hard questions. Well, I, you know, I think it's a hard question to answer because wars usually take a turn that is not expected when you start. And I mean, if you'd asked somebody in America in 1864, would you have launched the Civil War if you knew what was going to happen? Hard to say what the answer would have been because it was obviously much deadlier than anybody anticipated. Same with World War II and same with others. I think ultimately the Iraq War would have been worthwhile if we can prevail. And I, I think the odds well, against that are low. Well, you could say, excuse me, yeah. the ruffian is to go. We could have prevailed if we learned the lessons in your book and had the right technology, thought through the second stage. That's the lesson I get from your book. Right? If, if you'd written your book before the Iraq War, we might have won it. I knew it was my <laughs> fault. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for going by, Max Boot. And thank you for coming by, and come by next week to learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night.